Okay, so I think uh, we should get started. So Fernando, uh, thanks for coming and, and agreeing to present. Uh, everybody who's uh, uh, anybody who's new at this, the sort of ground rules are more or less treat this like a regular seminar. If you have a question or a comment, just uh, unmute your microphone and break in uh, like you would if we were all sitting in the room together. Uh, and then we'll have some time at the end also for uh, for more questions and comments. So if you want to uh, ask something, uh, uh, then that's also great. Uh, so Fernando, I'll turn it over to you. You have an hour. Okay. So thanks so much for the opportunity to present uh, this paper here, and thanks for uh, tuning in. Uh, so this is uh, joint work with Ana Maria, uh, also at the Fed. Uh, and the usual disclaimer applies. So these are our views and not the ones of the San Luis Fed or the Federal Reserve Board uh, or the Federal Reserve System. So today I'm gonna to be talking about international trade of essential goods during a pandemic. And this paper is motivated by the observation that some goods have proved critical to combat uh, the ongoing COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, think of personal protective equipment, uh, PPE like gloves, medical masks, face shields. Think of more sophisticated equipment like respirators, equipment for ICU units, and even uh, COVID-19 tests, which are more like a novel product. Uh, so during normal times, uh, trade plays a key role in allowing countries to gain access to its goods. So if you think of uh, production of these goods, this is highly concentrated in, uh, in a few locations. Just to give you an example, just 20% of the countries are net exporters of these goods. So most are net importers uh, of them. On the other hand, uh, uh, there's some countries that not only are, are uh, highly dependent, uh, are importing, but they're highly dependent on imports. Take the case of the US, 36% uh, of total absorption of these goods is actually coming from abroad. Okay, so maybe during normal times, uh, uh, there's nothing special about that, but in a global pandemic, uh, it raises an ease about relying so much on other countries, uh, and it has raised an ease about relying so much no, 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 on other can countries. I, can I yes. back in and ask you a question about those numbers? Um, do you know how those, your, you know, 20% of countries are net exporters, US absorbs a bunch of this stuff. Do you know whether those numbers correlate to, you know, which countries uh, have had particularly bad experiences with this? I mean, you'd imagine a country like the U.S. probably is going to import a bunch of this stuff just because it has had a particularly bad experience, whereas so I'm you know, about a country that, you know, numbers. Uh, just didn't have that many cases is obviously not going to import much of this stuff and might export, you know, whatever it doesn't need. So this is before the pandemic. These numbers are oh, prior before, to okay. the Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I see. Yeah. So... Now, in a global pandemic, it raised an ease about relying so much on other countries for these goods. Um, and now, uh, so if trade breaks down, the issue is that importers may end up, you know, with very limited access to these goods, okay? So the question we're asking, uh, one of the questions we're asking is to what extent does trade of these goods actually affect the impact of a pandemic, okay? So before I, I go into more details of what we do, let me just show you a couple of pictures that suggest that actually it has been a, a, a big deal or it might uh, be a big deal uh, over the, the ongoing pandemic. So here, what we see, uh, and I'm gonna show you, there's, wide, there's been widespread trade policy changes during the pandemic. So if you look at the, the left panel, this is data from Global Trade Alert and the World Bank. Basically, forget about the coloring, but just the if there's any coloring, it means that the countries introduce some sort of export control on medical supplies or medicines. Okay, so we see many, many countries introducing some sort of export controls over this period. In the right panel, we have countries that actually introduced uh, reductions in import barriers on these goods. Uh, so we see that also many, many countries introducing uh, reductions in import barriers. In some cases, it's actually the same countries, and this is because maybe they're introducing export controls on good A and reducing barriers on good B within this category, okay? Uh, so it seems that it raises the question of trade policy as a potentially important lever to address the pandemic and potentially uh, for a key role of trade uh, in essential medical goods during a pandemic, okay? Uh, moreover, uh, in, uh, in recent weeks, uh, the presidential candidate, the democratic presidential candidate has also uh, brought this issue to the forefront by, you know, uh, making it one of the one of the main uh, trade policy uh, proposals. 
you know, the issue of uh, trying to ensure that, you know, dealing with these uh, shortages of critical equipment that the U.S. has been facing uh, since the onset of the pandemic, okay? Uh, now, so the goal of the, of the paper is to study the role played by trade of essential medical goods during a pandemic. To do so, what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask three questions. First, we're gonna uh, ask what's the cross-country impact of a pandemic in a world that's interconnected via trade linkages. And then we're gonna look at the implications uh, for trade policy. First, we're gonna say, we're gonna ask, do countries prefer to decrease trade barriers once the pandemic hits? And finally, we're gonna look into what do countries prefer? So do they prefer to be hit with a pandemic in a world that has lower initial trade barriers or do they actually prefer to live in a world that's a bit more self-sufficient like has been, uh, like it's been discussed in some policy circles, okay? So the way we're gonna answer the question, this question is the following. We're gonna set up a quantitative dynamic model of international trade that's gonna feature in, uh, trade in essential goods. Uh, there's gonna be non-homothetic preferences for essential goods. Uh, then there's gonna be sectoral trade imbalances that are gonna be driven by differences in comparative advantage. Uh, and then there's gonna be also a sectoral adjustment costs on capital and on labor, okay? And these are gonna be slowing down the speed of at which countries can respond and can adjust production, okay? We're gonna use this framework to study the impact of a pandemic across countries and uh, the implications for trade policy. And finally, we're gonna contrast our findings with evidence uh, on the trade policy changes that we have observed over this period, okay? Um, so what do we find? The key finding is that the role of trade depends critically on the degree to which countries are specializing uh, in, in the production of essential goods. So what do we mean by this? Well, if you look at the impact of a pandemic across countries, what we find is that net importers of essential medical goods turn out to be worse off uh, during the pandemic than net exporters of these goods, okay? What do we find for trade policy? So once the pandemic hits, do countries wanna raise barriers? Do they wanna lower them? Well, what we find is that net importers wanna you know, improve access to these goods, so they wanna decrease trade barriers. And net exporters actually, uh, we find the reverse. They prefer a world in which trade barriers are actually increasing uh, during the pandemic, okay? And we show that these findings or these differences between net importers and net exporters are actually consistent with data uh, on the trade policy changes that were observed over this period. Okay, finally, we look at the role of trade openness or, or being close to trade at the onset of the pandemic. Net importers actually are better off being hit with a pandemic in a world that's a bit more closed to trade of essential goods. Net exporters, we find the reverse. They want to be operating in the kind of world in which we're now, and it may be even more open. Okay, so th those are our main findings. Those are preview of our results. Um, so this paper has also implications that extend beyond COVID-19 and beyond essential medical goods. Um, with, uh, um, so there's a broader range of essential goods that could be subject to you know, a broader set of global disruptions. And we think the ideas of our findings um, might also apply in those cases. There's other types of essential goods like food and agriculture, defense and steel. There's key production inputs that maybe, you know, are very disruptive if you lack access to these goods. And there's also a broader set of global shocks like pests, there's wars, there's political changes in, uh, changes in, in political regime. Like, you know, if the WTO, um, you know, there's a fallout of WTO or other stuff like that. Okay, moreover, our findings also connect uh, with the uh, theoretical literature on trade policy and their uncertainty. We think closest to us is uh, this work by Meyer in 1977 that was basically making a national defense argument for introducing uh, protection, trade protection. Uh, there's been also work by Jonathan, um, Jonathan Eaton and Jim Grossman on trade protection as a way of ensuring uh, against shocks. And there's, and, and there's a broader literature on trade policy under uncertainty by Hellman and Razin, and, and there's a, actually a handbook chapter on this uh, by Palmer in 84, okay? So what we think we bring to the table is a novel mechanism through which some of these ideas uh, come into play. We quantify it and we contrast with evidence, okay? Um, finally, there, this, this work is also related to, to, to a, a large literature on dynamic models of international trade here, just citing uh, two of our work, but there's clearly many others, many in the audience. Uh, so here, what we do is we look at some of the implications for trade policy in some of these models, 
So just jump in uh, if you have questions. Uh, I'm gonna otherwise just jump into, into the presentation of the model. Okay, so the model has two countries. Fernando, yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I just ask a quick question? The way you sort of framed it, um, the pandemic just sounds like a demand shock, um, just a, a global demand shock for certain types of goods. And um, is there something more than that to this kind of shock that, um, in, in, in what you're doing? It is, is going to be, in a big sense, a global demand shock. There's going to be something special about essential goods. And, and I'm going to show you in the next slide, but it's going to be that essential goods are going to be more inelastic. So we introduce this non homotheticity, so they're, they're going to be very inelastic goods. Um, and that's going, to, that's going to affect stuff. So I, I'm going to show you how the mechanism works. But yeah, in many, in many ways, it's a demand shock. Yes. OK. I mean, I, you know, I think in general, we would expect a demand shock. Um, if you had a positive demand shock, that there would be these distributional effects based on whether you're a big supplier of the good or, or, or not. So I, I guess it's just trying to figure out, like, what's, is there something special about the GE or is there something special about being a pandemic? Um, so maybe you can come back to it later. Yeah, yeah. No, but it, yeah. So let, let's get back to that once I show you then the mechanism. And so... There's two countries, there's home and foreign. I'm gonna show you everything for home, uh, but foreign is gonna be symmetric except for parameters. So there's gonna be two sectors, essential and non-essential. Essential is gonna be E, non-essential is gonna be C. And each country is gonna produce uh, a domestic variety of each. So there's gonna be four varieties of, this, of these two types of goods, uh, okay? Uh, in each country, there's gonna be households. Uh, there's gonna be a representative household. There's gonna be a producer, producer of a domestic variety in each sector. And there's going to be a producer of bundles of domestic and imported varieties in each sector. So it's going to be a guy who's going to be aggregating the domestic variety and the imported variety. And that's the good that's going to be used for consumption, for investment, for adjustment costs. Okay. Uh, there's going to be trade, obviously, uh, trade in essential and non-essential varieties, not at the level of the composite, but at the level of the variety. And there's going to be financial assets. So there's going to be a one period bond here. Okay. So let me start with the households. Households are going to have the following preferences. Uh, they're going to be infinitely leave, discount the future with a discount factor beta. And they're going to have the following. Uh, it's going to be an additive uh, utility, pure utility. That's going to have one component. It's going to be log C. So that's pretty standard. And then it's going to have this term uh, that's going to be the, the utility, the pure utility they get from the consumption of essential goods. Now, what's different here is that they're going to be evaluated, they're going to be getting utility from essential goods by evaluating it relative to a reference level. So it's going to be this E bar T is going to be the reference level of essential goods, and ET is going to be the amount of essential goods consumed by these guys, okay? And eta is going to be the sensitivity to deviations from these reference levels, okay? So what do we have in mind with this? This is in many ways, uh, it has the same spirit as Stongiri. Stongiri, you have subsistence and you're basically comparing your consumption to subsistence. Here it's more, uh, here it's similar, but we don't have this, you know, this, uh, this kink at the, at the reference level. Here you can go below or above the, the reference level and, and you're fine. Um, so basically, uh, and you're com comparing your consumption of essential goods relative to its reference level. So if you think of food consumption, you're comparing to physical needs. Uh, if you think of health services, you're comparing to maybe medical needs, to so some reference level of medical needs that you have, okay? Some implications of this structure is that the demand for essential goods is gonna be less elastic uh, than for non-essential goods. That's number one. Number two is gonna give us a tight mapping between this E bar over E and the data that we're gonna use to discipline the pandemic shock. So we're gonna use estimates of the E bar over E to pin down what the shock is uh, with this pandemic. And finally, just the observation that actually, while it looks a little different, this is actually CR array on essential goods uh, with risk aversion one plus eta. It just looks, it's written a bit differently, but that's basically what you end up getting, okay? Okay, so that's the household. Just to illustrate how these preferences look like, take a, a low level of E bar that's, uh, so this is the utility level as a function of your consumption of E of essential goods. And you start with a low level of E bar, low reference level, and imagine you're consuming here and suddenly a pandemic hits and your reference level gets shot. So you suddenly need more, uh, you have more needs for essential goods. 
So what that does is that actually, if your consumption doesn't adjust, actually your utility is gonna decline and you're gonna be in, a, in this lower utility level. And then of course, you might have an incentive to adjust your consumption for these goods, okay? So that's the preferences of the household for essential goods. Now, the rest of the problem is actually pretty standard. These guys uh, are endowed with one unit of labor that's gonna be supplied inelastically at a wage rate W. And these guys are also gonna own the domestic producers of essential and non-essential varieties. And actually, and they're gonna get the profits and there's gonna be actual profits in, in each of these sectors, okay? Finally, there's financial markets. They're gonna be able to save or borrow with a one period bond at an interest rate R, okay? And there's gonna be a bond holding cost that's gonna be penalizing deviations of your bond holdings relative to a steady state level. So given this, the problem is standard. They are max they're choosing consumption of each of the goods and the bond to maximize lifetime expected utility subject to the budget constraint. The income is basically the WT, the profits, and whatever they're borrowing. And they use all these resources to consume each of the goods, to repay the previous debt, and to pay the bond holding cost. Okay? So that's the household. Now onto the producers of domestic varieties. The structure is the same for both sectors. So I'm just gonna present for some sector J uh, that can be C if it's non-essential or it's E if it's essential. These guys operate two technologies. Fernando, for, yeah. Fernando, just, uh, I think this comes through with the previous slide. Uh, so these things are not storable and they're not durable. So there's, you know, ventilators are very durable um, and really, it's kind of like the change, um, uh, you, you know, you'd like to have a state variable that captures how many, how much, how many ventilators. Likewise, all the PPE is very storable. So you'd like to have the stock yes. of those things. Uh, and yes. so there's no stockpiling or durability here, which seems like it's going to be critical for any quantification, unless you're thinking about some really long run dynamics. But yeah, those are, so those are good points. So the stockpiling, so the durability actually we we haven't thought much about and yeah that's a and, and we should uh, the stockpiling and so the inventory issue is actually something that has been discussed uh, also as another way of addressing some of these shortages so you can jack up your production or you can just you know buy a bunch of stuff store it somewhere and then use it when you need it uh, so that's in our list of stuff to do and to look at but we haven't done it yet um, that's right. So for now, yeah, there's none of those two aspects in here. Um, but that, I mean, I think that that will affect uh, how you think about estimating those elasticities then. If, if, uh, if you're, yeah, I mean, I think like if the real world has stockpiling, um, you're going to get a very different elasticity on consumption than you would uh, on based on like trade flows. Yeah, you might. Um, no, I mean, it's, Trade flows can yeah. go to zero, which is you're, you're still using the stuff. Yeah, um, you can still consume that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, and that will have a possibly different implications for what you might want. So that's an extra instrument potentially for trade policy. So here we're giving the, we're not gonna be doing optimal policy. We're gonna be, but it's gonna, but basically we're just playing with the trade costs here. Okay. Uh, but if you have this extra instrument stockpiling, maybe that's something that these guys may wanna do, yeah. Um, yes. I mean, there, there, there is there is a, a pandemic stockpile of PPE. Yes. Um, there, there no, was, I know. Right? I, uh, <laughs> there was. It ran out. Um, yeah. and, and there's actually proposals of having stockpiles, not just at the national level, but even like a, like a global stockpile that maybe you know countries can chip in. And I mean, yeah. A lot of countries had them and then threw them out, suggesting that. There is a cost to maintaining the stockpile. Absolutely. Yeah. I see. Yeah, yeah, okay. we, we should look more into that. Yes. Um, so these guys are operating, they're producing, they're, they're doing two things. They're producing varieties. Uh, how? Capital and labor, uh, some capital share, and they have a sector specific and a country specific actually productivity level. And then they accumulate capital with a just standard law of motion for capital, okay? Um, now, what's a bit different is they have sectoral adjustment costs. So they, it's costly for them to adjust their capital stock and their labor. Um, and they, so we have uh, quadratic adjustment costs on capital and labor, okay? So is Finally, capital, 
Sorry, Fernando, is capital mobile between the two sectors of labor? Yes, okay. but, it's, but it's costly to do so. So, so this is the capital accumulation happens at the variety level. So if you're a producer of non-essential goods, you have to invest. And so in that sense, yeah, it's not mobile. It's not freely mobile. It's not like you can use it either way. Uh, and the capital is the uh, non-essential good or it's a composite of the two goods? It's a non-essential goods here. Okay. I don't think it matters much because essential goods are a small fraction of what it would be. But yeah, we just assume that it's non-essential. Um, so finally, we have that firms are myopic. Uh, so what we have is that when they're making these investment decisions, they discount profits with beta. So not with the actual household discount fa stochastic discount factor. Uh, so what we, what we have here is that the essential good producers are not gonna internalize the value of production during a pandemic beyond whatever is showing up through prices. Okay, and one reason uh, and, and one thing that this delivers is that it captures the use of, or the threat of use of this Defense Production Act in the US during COVID-19 where, you know, government, the government was, you know, threatening firms to, or even in some cases using it, uh, to get them to produce more and actually to respond to the pandemic. So they're not internalizing the value of these goods to households utility beyond prices. Um, okay, so, Given that, the problem is uh, the following, they're maximizing lifetime expected profits uh, with discounting at rate beta. Profits are just the revenue minus the labor cost, minus the investment, uh, minus the adjustment costs, okay? And then you have the law of motion for capital and the production technology, okay? So that's what's going on at the variety level. Um, finally, and this, we're moving towards closing the model. We have all these varieties floating around, but the way in which they're used to be used for consumption or investment, we have these producers of a composite good that are aggregating domestic and imported varieties with a standard CS technology and some elasticity sigma. And, and there's a trade cost to import stuff, okay? So that affects the price that these guys face. Uh, so the composite good is used for consumption, investment, adjustment costs, and the essential goods are only used for consumption. So that's, that's basically our setup. Uh, we have a, a competitive equilibrium, it's pretty standard definition. Agents are optimizing. We have market clean condition for labor, for the, uh, varieties, and also for the composites. And then we have financial market clearing, which is basically that the bonds are in zero net supply. Everything else is symmetric. So everything is symmetric for the foreign country, except for parameters, okay? So, let me tell you a bit about how we're thinking about how we're using this model to think about the ongoing pandemic. So first, what's a pandemic in our model? Uh, so we model a pandemic as an increase in this reference level E bar, okay? What's the goal? The goal is to capture the increased needs for essential medical goods. So in that sense, it's, it's, it's basically a demand shock, like uh, George was saying, and which is gonna deliver a lower utility if these increased needs are not gonna be satisfied. There's many things this doesn't capture about, about this pandemic or other pandemics. One is we have nothing to say about lockdown policies, their economic consequences, anything like that. So we're abstracting from all of those forces. Maybe more importantly, we also abstract from the potential endogeneity between the increased needs and the level of economic activity. So presumably, you know, if you're really good at, you know, if you're locking down and you, shut down the pandemic, you have less needs. So we're abstracting from that here. So we just take the increased needs as exogenous and we study the role of it for international trade. Uh, so what's the impact of a pandemic in our model? First of all, there's a sharp increase in demand for essential it, Fernando? needs. Fernando? Yes. yes. Would it, can you consider kind of different correlations between the E-bar in the two different countries? Like, is it really global or you know, it's always gonna be harder hit one country than another. So that might alleviate Absolutely. some of the problem. We don't have it here. So here we're gonna hit, it's actually a global change in E and it's the yeah. same in, in, in the two countries. Uh, we have done some exercises looking at just a local shock and there the implications for policy and even the effects are very different because right. uh, if it you have a local like pandemic, but you have a, 
another country that can supply you goods and it doesn't need them. Yeah. Kind of more pro trade, I think, then, right? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And that's, a, yeah, so that didn't make it to this talk, but yeah, that's something that definitely we're, we're thinking of, yes. Yes, we, I, yeah, absolutely. I was also thinking about the, just the correlation of the, the increase in the need for the essential goods with just the decline in overall production or, or TFP or something, just to capture the fact that income's going down for, for everybody at the same time. Yes, um, yeah, so it might not be fully innocuous, abstracting from that, and actually we're thinking of introducing it to, uh, as part of the exercise, maybe having a labor supply shock and just matching GDP change or something like that, or labor. Um, exactly. Yeah, so that's, yeah, uh, but we don't know how much that might impact. Yes. And for Thank Vendor, you. Yeah. Uh, what are the expectations on this ET? Um, is it people know it's coming? Um, they think it's going to last forever? So we're going to, I'm going to show you the experiment, how we set it up. So what we have now is an, we have an MIT shock. We have an unexpected shock. The, the, nobody was expecting a pandemic like this. Uh, and you just get hit. Now, given that you're hit, then you, you see it, there's some persistence that it just reverts back to, to the usual. Um, okay. Doesn't mean, yeah, we're not, so yeah. But. Okay. Okay, so. Okay, so what's the impact of a pandemic? There's a sharp increase in the demand for essential medical goods. Now, there's this big demand for them, but it's hard to adjust production in the short run. So you're basically forced to rely on trade, but you know, the other country also needs uh, the goods. Uh, so, so that's going on on one side. Then on the other side, there's an inelastic demand for essential goods. Uh, you know, prices might be going up because you cannot adjust production. But maybe, you know, if demand was more elastic, then you might be able to just consume less and maybe you're, maybe you're fine. But these goods, you're very inelastic, okay? Uh, what that means is that this pushes prices to increase even further, okay? So in the model, uh, uh, what the model implies for this, and one way to see it is this equation that comes from the model, you have the relative price of essential goods as a function of uh, consumption of the two types of goods and the reference level. So if you think that take, you know, the value of C and E, you know, fixed in the short run, say in the first period, then the change in E bar is gonna be really impacting the change in prices, okay? So that's basically what's happening here and how it's impacting prices. Okay, now condition on a change in prices, how is this feeding differentially on the, uh, across these two types of countries? Uh, so here, what happens is that net importers of essential medical goods turn out to be worse off because prices are going up and net exporters are better off. And this mechanism um, uh, uh, comes a lot from uh, this paper that we have with, with David and, and Hakon, okay? So, so the way it works is the following. Uh, you have this uh, relationship that also comes from the model that relates real absorption as a function of real output and this relative price. So it's, this is the relative PPI to the relative CPI. And basically what happens is that when the price of essential goods goes up for net importers, this declines, this is a negative terms of trade effect. So this lowers the PPI relative to the CPI. So it leads to lower absorption, uh, especially if output is not changing much. Okay, the reverse happens for net exporters. When there's this shock, the relative price, uh, the relative PPI goes up relative to the CPI. So that allows the net exporters actually to consume relatively more of both goods, okay? Um, so that's the way this is impacting the two countries differentially and why one is be better off and that one is worse off. Now, that's basically the mechanism, the basic mechanism that's, that's active in the model. What we do next is we, we, we go and we, we ask quantitatively, what's the impact of the pandemic across these two countries? And then we look at the implications for trade policy. So first we ask, well, do countries prefer to decrease trade barriers once the pandemic hits? Uh, and then we ask, well, do they prefer to be hit with a pandemic in a world with lower initial trade barriers? So uh, once, yeah. So one is more how countries respond. The other one is more like, where would you want to be? Do you want to be in a, in a closed world initially, or do you want to be in a more open world? 
to answer these questions, uh, we, we got to parameterize the model. We do so in the following way. Uh, one period in the model is going to be a month. Um, there's going to be, well, the two countries. Home is going to be the US. Foreign is going to be the rest of the world. And we're going to do the following. We're going to take the two countries to be identical. All parameters are going to be the same, except for the sectoral productivities, OK? So except for the, the, the pattern of comparative advantage. So we're going to have home be more productive. So the US is going to be more productive in non-essential goods. So AC is going to be higher than AE. And the foreign, the rest of the world, is going to be relatively more productive. And it's going to be more productive uh, in essential goods than in non-essential goods. OK, so we introduce, so we further the symmetry and normalization. So we assume that uh, the least productive good in each country, we normalize the productivity to one and we make the productivities in the most productive uh, sector uh, to be equal to each other, okay? So what we do then is we estimate the parameters to get the home country to match the US moments. Whatever parameters give us that, then we apply the same parameters actually in, in the foreign country, okay? Um, and one thing we do is, yeah, for essential goods, we basically take PPE and other medical goods. Non-essential is gonna be all other goods uh, in the economy. Okay, so some further details about the parametrization. This is all for steady state. So we, and then I'm gonna show you a bit about the, the dynamics. So first we have a set of predetermined parameters. We have beta, uh, the elasticity of substitution, the capital share, the depreciation rate. And we assume there's no home bias. So the omegas are just equal to each other. Um, now, Given those parameters, we choose these six parameters to match these six moments. So we have sectoral productivities, we have the utility weight on the essential goods, we have the two trade costs, we have the reference level of essential goods, and we have the sensitivity of essential goods to the reference level. Okay, so what are we targeting? We're targeting the sectoral imbalance in essential goods in the US. So this is, there's minus 25%. Uh, so net exports are, is minus 25% of output in essential goods. Uh, now, how big are essential goods in total GDP uh, of goods? That's 3%. Uh, and then we target the import shares in each sector. So what's the import share in essential goods? What's the import share of non-essential goods? Okay. And then finally, we have these two things. One has to do with the reference level. So how do we choose the reference level? Well, we assume that in steady state, just E is equal to E bar. So we're just gonna choose E bar to ensure that these two are equal to each other. And finally, uh, we choose the eta to match the price elasticity. And this comes from, and this we're still trying to figure out uh, how to pin it down. But at this point, it's coming from a paper in the Journal of Health Economics where they basically estimate the price and income elasticities uh, for different types of health services. And, and we're basically looking at the lower bound of those estimates thinking of the pandemic as a, as a case in which you actually need this, uh, maybe you're more elastic, inelastic in these goods. Okay, so that's the parametrization for the state state. Given this parametrization, this is the way we implement the, the exercise and we pin down the rest of the parameters. Uh, what's the shock? There's, first, there's the shock to Ibar. So uh, what we do to pin it down is the following. We focus on the needs we think of needs as E bar capturing the needs for these goods versus availability that we think of E of N95 masks from January to May 2020. Okay, so for this, we are just focusing on masks for now, uh, given the data that we have available. Uh, how do we pin it down? Well, we take estimates from the White House COVID 19 supply chain task force that basically estimates needs and actually supply for these goods. Uh, and what they estimate is that in this period, actually, they increased quite a bit. So it increased by 1.22 log points. Okay, so we choose the shock to EVAR to match uh, this change. Then given the shock, we are choosing adjustment cost to match the change in output of masks over this period as well. And for this data, we have, we just take data from one of the major producers, 3M, they report a 59% increase of production in the US from 22 million to 35 million per month. So that's what we're going on. Uh, that's what we're going with uh, in the, for now. And then finally, we have the bond holding costs. 
And there we target the change in aggregate net exports to GDP, which we estimate to be around one percentage point change, okay, uh, in this period. Okay, so that covers all the parameters and all the exercise. What's the experiment? The experiment is we're gonna think of the economy as being in a steady state before the shock hits. Uh, and we're gonna study the impact of an unexpected transitory shock to E-bar, okay? There's gonna be a gradual increase of E-bar over E. So we're gonna feed the shock uh, gradually uh, to match what we see in the data. It's gonna peak after a few months and then it's gonna regress back to basically to their state state level at, with a persistent 0.85. Uh, yeah, we're still working on exactly the timing and how far to spread it out, but that's what we're going with uh, for today. Okay, so what do we find? What's the cross country impact of a pandemic? Yes. When you said it's an MIT shock, is it MIT shock all the way or is it just initially a shock and then there's perfect, there's the people realize these, the autoregressive persistence? No, they realize the autoregressiveness of the, of the shock. So they get hit by the shock and then suddenly they know, yeah. Um, okay. There could also be uncertainty over that, over the path as we currently face. But yeah, we're, we don't have that here. There's a lot of resistance and it could still be stochastic. Oh, is it just a, it's a no, perfect I, foresight? Yeah, it's perfect foresight. So there could be uncertainty. Yeah, but we don't have that here. Okay. Yes. Um, so what's the cross-country impact of a pandemic? Uh, we're going to show, so there's many panels. So each panel has a different variable. The blue line is home. The red line is going to be foreign. Okay. Uh, home, remember, is the U.S. It's a net importer of essential goods. Foreign is the net exporter of essential goods. It's the rest of the world. Okay. Uh, so what do we find? We find that there's first there's an increase in E, E bar over E. That's how we're choosing the shock. And so that pushes for higher demand for essential goods. Okay. So now there's limits to short run adjustment. Output cannot increase rapidly. It can only increase gradually, and that's going to lead to an increase in the price, in the relative price of essential goods to non-essential goods, okay? At the end of the day, the impact on real GP is, is not very big, uh, but that's, that's, that's what we have, okay? Now, that's the change in output, so output is going to increase gradually. What happens is that on the demand side, the demand can also, you know, is not going to respond, uh, it's not going to be, it's, it's very inelastic, okay? What does that mean is that, you know, Maybe you have the demand shock, output increases gradually, but if you're elastic, you can you know, substitute away of that good. And then it doesn't have a huge impact on yourself. In this case, you, this good is very inelastic. So what that means is that you know, on the demand side, you're also inelastic, on the output side, you cannot adjust either. So that means that the sectoral imbalances are exacerbated given these two forces, which actually makes the terms of trade shock even bigger, okay? Um, so the impact on consumption, so here you, you see the terms of trade shock, you know, making it, you know, it's an improvement for the, for the net exporter. It's a, it's a decline in terms of trade for, net, for the net importer. That fits directly into real absorption and therefore into the consumption that these guys can make of, you know, the, the essential and non-essential, uh, sorry, uh, into the essential and non-essential good, okay? Um, so in particular, what we have is that the home country, the net importer can increase essential goods by less than the net exporter. Okay. So that's the baseline pandemic exercise. Now we're saying it's better off, uh, but uh, what are the welfare differences between these two? So this is what we're gonna do to try to quantify and to give some kind of welfare measure. Um, so actually, Okay, let me, let me, I'll show you that in, the, in, the, in a couple of slides, actually. So that's the basic exercise. What we do next is we're going to look at the, uh, at the role of policy, okay, to make things better or worse. So do countries prefer to decrease trade barriers once the pandemic hits? What we're going to do here, we're not going to be doing optimal policy, uh, not yet. Uh, for now, we're going to do this following simple exercise. We're going to take the same pandemic, the same exercise we just showed you, and we're gonna consider a global increase of trade barriers during the pandemic. Uh, so trade costs are just gonna go up uh, for six months, okay? And we're gonna see what happens. Uh, and they're gonna go up in both countries. So for each country, we're gonna contrast 
you know, this exercise versus the baseline. And we're going to look at there. We're going to show you the welfare effects. Okay, so you're going to see what so happens with trade. Fernando, these are yeah. trade costs. Why are you doing trade costs instead of tariffs? These are trade costs. Um, yeah, so we it's we, we're going to look at that. Uh, we want to look at that. So it was the first. Yeah, uh, we we think the effects are going to be similar. Uh, me for the welfare calculation, uh, you know, the levels might be slight, it might be different, but we believe that you know this is going to introduce differences across the two countries, and we believe those differences are going to be. Uh, it seems like it's going to have a pretty pretty big difference in terms of the any welfare impacts. Um, it's definitely going to affect the welfare numbers. It's yeah. less clear to us whether it's going to affect the differences that we find between the two countries. But okay. that's something, yes, that's uh, on, our, on our list okay. to do. Um, one way, okay, one reason why we introduced this is we wanted to, so, and you're gonna see later on if, if I have time, we wanted to push it to the limit uh, in terms of, you know, just shutting down trade. And in that case, it, it wouldn't matter uh, because then you don't have trade. Uh, we ended up going with a more intermediate case, in which case it raises the questions of revenue that you're raising. So, yes. Okay, so what happens uh, with uh, when, when you raise trade costs uh, during the pandemic? Here, we show you the results a little different. So the top row has all the a bunch of variables for home country. The bottom row has uh, five variables for the foreign country. And here the colors reflect the blue is the baseline and the red is the, the economy in which trade costs are, are, are being raised, okay? So the first thing you see is that the trade policy change, and you might not be surprised, you know, raising the trade costs is gonna lead to an increase in the relative price of essential goods relative to non-essential goods, okay? And given that, everything that I described earlier is, is gonna be applying. So prices are going up, you know, but output cannot increase very quickly. Demand is not gonna be adjusting, you know, just because you say it's expensive, you're not gonna not buy masks. Uh, so what that's gonna do is that's gonna widen imbalances even more, okay? Um, so if you take a look at the net importer, for, is, for instance, so here you see the widening of the net imbalances, and therefore given the widening of net imbalances, there's less absorption, uh, and therefore less consumption of, of the two goods. So what's going on is that the net importer is basically uh, in steady state, it's operating with a small scale. It's relying on the other country for production of these goods. So it has a small scale, it has a comparative disadvantage, and suddenly you're making it dip more difficult to import these goods, okay? Um, so even if you invest, this guy doesn't have a comparative advantage, so there's a slower increase of essential goods in this country. It's a larger decline of terms of trade, which leads to lower profits, lower absorption, lower consumption of non-essentials. So this guy is worse off. Um, what happens to the guy that's a net exporter of essential goods? This guy has a big production scale. This guy was supplying the other country, he was a net exporter. And suddenly we're raising trade costs. This is making it harder to export. Um, okay, so what happens? So this guy has all this scale in there, has a bunch of capital, a bunch of labor in the sector. Suddenly it cannot export. So this guy can reallocate exports to be sold domestically. Okay, so therefore this adds a margin in which this country can increase the consumption of essential goods despite having lower access to imports and despite it being difficult to adjust uh, production, okay? At the same time, there's a terms of trade effect that raises profits, raises consumption of non-essential goods and raises absorption. So this guy is better off, okay? Um, so that's the, that, those are the inputs responses. Uh, let's take a look at the, welfare effects, so how valuable are these policies and how much they damage the, the so how much they damage the home country, how much they benefit uh, the foreign. So this is how we do it. So the thing is, we model the pandemic as a transitory shock. So we don't wanna look at the welfare effects over the whole lifetime of these guys. We wanna scale it by, you know, the period uh, that might be more reasonable for the pandemic. So. Just take, consider the first 12 or 24 months uh, after the pandemic hits. And we're gonna contrast leaving the first T periods after the pandemic in either of two worlds. 
One is the world with the baseline pandemic in which no change, there's no change in trade barriers. And we're gonna compare that with a world in which there's a global increase in trade barriers on essential goods. Okay, so we're gonna measure this in consumption equivalent units of non-essential goods. And we're gonna ask, well, what percentage change of non-essential consumption are you willing to, you know, do you need to increase or do you, are you willing to give up to be indifferent to this other world with changes in trade policy? So this is what we find. We find, for instance, if you look at say the, uh, and actually this change is just done over this, the period of the pandemic. So you're just changing uh, this percent uh, over the 12 months or the 24 months uh, that the pandemic lasts. So for instance, the net importer, uh, the net importer is worse off by this trade policy. Uh, so if you take the, the economy, you know, the baseline model, you have to cut consumption every period of over the first 12 months by 2.8% to make him indifferent to be in the world with a trade policy change. So this guy loses, this guy wins uh, by 1.8%. So you need to raise uh, consumption of non-essentials by 1.8% every period over the year of the pandemic to make him indifferent uh, to be in the other world. And uh, well, and these are the numbers for 24 months, two years, it's lower because as the pandemic, you know, starts to fade, the gains are lower of this trade policy. Okay, uh, so those are the welfare effects. The question that we ask next is, well, are these findings consistent with trade policy changes that we have observed during this, this pandemic, during these months? Um, so how are we gonna answer this question? We're gonna contrast trade policy changes across countries. Uh, so by grouping countries based on the trading balances pre-COVID-19, okay? So the goods we're gonna look at are medical goods that are essential to combat COVID-19 as they have been classified by the Peterson Institute. Trade policy changes are coming from global trade alert. Here we're showing you the results up to mid-April of 2020. Uh, and basically we classify them into export curves and import liberalization. And we classify sectoral imbalances uh, based on data for 2018 from country. Okay, so what do we find? We find the following. Take import liberalizations. Who's doing these import liberalizations? So we find that 28%, almost 29% of net importers have introduced some sort of import liberalization on, on critical medical goods. In contrast, net exporters of these goods, uh, only 18% did introduce some sort of import liberalization over this period. On the other side, of, uh, we see export curves. Many countries have been introducing export curves as we saw before in the maps. Uh, who's doing this? Well, it's mostly net exporters of these goods. So 86% of net exporters of these goods have introduced some sort of export curve in this period. A lot less, almost a half, uh, of net importers have done so on some good, okay? Um, so our interpretation of this evidence is that this is consistent with the findings that we, that we showed you earlier. Net importers seem to be more likely to lower import barriers and to want to do that than net exporters. And net exporters are more likely to introduce export curves than net importers of these goods. Um, okay, uh, so let me, let me move on to the last exercise where we, we take a standard, it's, so, so we ask the following question. Do countries prefer to be hit with the pandemic under low initial trade barriers? So we say, okay, imagine that you can choose where to be. You know, you can be in the world, that's the baseline model, or you can be in a world that has, you know, more or less trade initially. Uh, do you prefer that or not? So, to answer this question, we consider the pandemic in a world in which there's no trade of essential goods. Okay, so we take the extreme in which actually countries are self-sufficient in essential goods, and we see what happens, okay? Uh, so for each country, we're gonna contrast the baseline model uh, with the world in which there's no trade of essential goods. We look at the impulse response functions, and we look at the welfare gains, okay? This is what we find. So, before I describe the, the panels, let me just give you a sense of, the, of what's really going on here. What happens is when you don't have trade of essential goods, you obviously don't have any sectoral imbalances, okay? So you have the demand shock, you need these goods, that's pushing prices to be higher, you know, 
they're not as high as in the baseline, but they're higher. But even, even though the price is changing, you know, uh, there's no sectoral imbalances. So this is not impacting, this is not leading to changes in terms of trade, and therefore it's not really affecting uh, this. So this channel is not active, okay? So take the net importer of essential goods. This guy is self-sufficient. Uh, so there's a change in the price of essential goods. You might think that's bad, but it turns out it's affecting similarly the income side and the expenditure side. So both income is going up and expenditures are going, are going up. Uh, so in that sense, that sectoral imbalance is not really kicking in or having any impact. Uh, at the same, yeah. That question. The dynamics here are, could be driven by one of two things. One is the capital stock dynamics. And the other is the fact that this e, your E-bar process is had a big, I guess, a big upward tick, and now is declining. Yes. And, and is it mostly the second that's driving why these are step functions? Sorry, which thing? I mean, like, why is it gradual? Yeah. Yeah. So yes, it's it's mostly actually, well, so the production side is definitely adjustment costs. Yes, mm -hmm. and, but there's also a demand side. I mean, it wouldn't be a step function because like you say, you have this, this shock that has a shape. So, uh, but it definitely wouldn't be ham shape like this. You would track a lot more uh, mm -hmm. the shape of the shock. Yes. Interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, we should, yeah. So we have in the paper some exercises uh, where we try to tease out the role playing by each of the channels. Uh, for instance, if you shut down the adjustment cost, you get a word without the adjustment cost or lower adjustment cost and what each of these channels or ingredients is playing. Um, we don't have it here today, but uh, yeah, that's... So there you can see there's much faster adjustment of output and also of consumption. Um, now, because this shock is hitting this country, living in a world in which it, it wasn't importing goods, Basically, this guy was self-sufficient. He need to have a higher capital stock and he need to have more labor in place uh, to be able to consume the goods that he need, okay? Uh, therefore, it's in a better place to increase output and it can increase the output faster because he has all this scale in place, okay? Um, at the same time, because there's no terms of trade effect, there's a lower decline of absorption, basically no change of absorption and no change or a small change, uh, small decline in non-essential good consumption. So this guy seems to be better off with the, pand you know, with the pandemic uh, and no access to trade of essential goods. Uh, what happens to the other country? Well, this is the, the coin flips here. This guy cannot benefit from the terms of trade, uh, the benefit in terms of trade increase. So that channel is, uh, is out of the window. On the other hand, this guy also doesn't have this big scale in place that was allowing him to provide uh, goods to, you know, both domestically and abroad. So it has a lower initial scale and that uh, leads to a slower growth of output uh, for essential goods. So output increases more slowly, okay? At the same time, yeah, because there's no terms of trade effect, no effect on absorption, and actually a decline in non-essential goods. So this guy is worse off. Okay, um, so that's what we find. The welfare implications are, uh, are uh, follow just what I just described. We do the same exercise, but now we're comparing uh, the baseline model with the pandemic in a world without trade of essential goods. And what we find is that uh, if you look at the home country, the home country is actually better off. It prefers to live in the world without trade of essential goods over the first 12 months and also over the first two years uh, with a 3.5, 3.6% increase in consumption of non-essential goods every period. Um, whereas uh, the foreign country is, is really worse off. So this country actually loses a lot by not having access to this to trade. Uh, Okay, so this is minus 24% over the first 12 months, every period over the first 12 months, and 16% uh, over the two years, okay? So those are the welfare results, and this following on, 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 the, on the, yeah, so following on what Jonathan was asking, uh, what we do in the paper, we 
we don't show it here, but we have this slide is uh, we investigate the role played by each of the channels and ingredients that we that we have in the model for our findings. So what we show is that, so we look at the effect of sectoral adjustment costs, non-homothetic preferences and myopic firms. We find these three ingredients to actually play an important role. If you look at sectoral adjustment cost, if you have a lower adjustment cost, basically output can increase faster. And basically you have this, you know, this big surge in demand, but if output can increase it, then you don't get any effects, any increases, this amplification of sectoral imbalances, and basically demand can be, uh, can meet supply much faster. Um, similarly, we have non-homothetic preferences playing an important role. Uh, Basically, this is kind of the flip coin of the output side. So in some sense, output is very inelastic because of the adjustment costs. Well, non-homothetic preferences and this low elasticity of income and, and uh, this low rights and income elasticities basically make demand also very inelastic and not adjust in response to changes in prices or income. Okay, uh, so if you get rid of, uh, so if you, if you have a world in which there's, uh, you know, homothetic preferences like a log log world. Uh, many of our of our results actually uh, go away because sectoral imbalances are not exacerbated, but they're closed down when the shock hits. Finally, uh, myopic firms also playing an important role. Firms are not internalizing this large marginal utility that they have that households have when the pandemic hits. Um, and the way this is working is similar to adjustment costs in a way. So. This is also slowing down the adjustment of output. Uh, so there's physical adjustment costs, but this is, this is acting in a very similar way. This is making firms not realize that actually there's a big return to be made in terms of utility uh, from actually increasing output uh, when the shock hits, okay? Uh, and clearly there's interesting trade policy implications, you know, uh, there will be different incentives of a planner versus individual firms for producing essential goods, you know. Um, and um, anyway, so this is stuff that we were looking forward to exploring uh, soon. So that's, uh, let, me, let me just conclude. Uh, the question we're asking is, what's the role of trade of essential medical goods during a pandemic? What we find is that the net trade position is key for whether trade amplifies or mitigates the pandemic. Net importers are better off lowering trade barriers during the pandemic, whereas net exporters are actually better off raising trade barriers during the pandemic. And actually we see that that's, that's what happened uh, over recent months. Trade policy changes during the COVID-19 pandemic have depended and have varied systematically based on sectoral imbalances prior to the pandemic. Uh, clearly our findings raise questions about additional motives for trade policy, maybe in the long run. Uh, there's, you know, of obviously a lot of work on specialization based on comparative advantage. Uh, this, uh, well, this raises the question of specialization based on comparative advantage versus specialization based on maybe resilience to trade disruption. Maybe you really value some goods and even though you're not very good at producing them, maybe you wanna produce them because you, know, uh, you might get a shock that's very costly. Okay, so it raises the question of whether protectionism, at least in some goods, uh, might be optimal as a way to self-insure against global shocks. And here the key word is global. Uh, it's like Sam was saying, well, if you have local shocks, uh, this can, you know, uh, there's other margins to insure yourself. Uh, trade can be actually great. You actually might want trade openness in that case. Uh, and finally, we believe this, many of these chances are actually much broader than just medical goods. There's other goods that might be very inelastic that you might think of as essential, like food, defense goods, key production inputs that maybe are just produced, you know, in some place that, you know, that are key, uh, that are very low elasticity goods. So goods like this might uh, face similar issues. So anyway, so that's what we have. So uh, any other comments, questions, I'm super happy uh, to get any feedback. Okay, great. Thanks, Fernando. So uh, what we'll do, I see Ryan, I was asking a question in the chat room. Ryan, you might as well, why don't you just unmute and ask it here, and then anybody else who wants to, uh, wants to ask, just, uh, just jump in. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Just uh, a quick question. Can you just talk a little bit about how intermediate input, like, the, like if, 
home dependent on foreign uh, to produce essential goods or, or, you know, or if foreign dependent on home to produce essential goods, how, how might that kind of uh, affect the results? So you mean for essential medical goods or, in, or, or, or just thinking of intermediate team? So yeah, exactly. Just more for like the, like medical goods, like, you know, you talk about, uh, uh, you know how how countries might want to produce these things themselves, but like, if they if do they need to sort of have all stages of the production process? That's another that was in this yeah. in the motivation you talked about. So yeah, I'm so we to, haven't looked at, at oh, any. Sorry, sorry. Okay, so no, so thanks for the question. So there's been a lot of discussion about uh, supply chains and supply chain disruptions. So here for now, we don't have any, any of that. Uh, so this is basically a good idea. Both countries can produce independently just with capital and labor that's domestic. Uh, if there's an input, I, I imagine that if there's an input that you need to produce the good domestically, that's only produced somewhere else, then you might wanna get access to that good and you don't, you, you know, it might add some subtleties to the kind of trade policy that you wanna implement. Uh, you clearly, you probably don't want to introduce trade barriers and goods that you need to produce this, these essential goods. So, but, but we haven't looked at it, but it's a, yeah, an interesting question. I think more generally, um, some intermediate inputs have very low elasticity of substitution in the short run. Uh, you know, some parts that are only produced in some location and, you know, if there's some trade disruption like recent years have brought, uh, that can be very costly. Uh, so that's more generally the way the aspects of intermediate inputs that we've been more focused on. Great. Stefania, you have a question? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Okay, perfect. Well, first of all, Fernando, this is impressive that you guys put together all the stuff in such a short time. Um, I just wanted to build up on a comment that Jonathan made earlier. Um, so here, of course, the agents know what the persistence of the shock is, but we know that the reality is that we don't know what that is. So I'm wondering whether is it going to be really hard to solve the model having that persistence uh, to be uncertain and whether on the top of your head you have some idea of what will be the main things that will change or if you don't think it will make a big difference. Uh, we we haven't thought much about uh, introducing that uncertainty. So we've been more focused about or, or more aware of you know, the, the, so we have an MIT shock, but you can imagine that ex ante, you know that there's some small probability of, uh, of this pandemic or a big disaster. So that's the aspect of uncertainty that we've been thinking more about. Uh, but we haven't really thought too much about uh, the, the proposal that Jonathan was suggesting. Uh, I don't think it would be very difficult to introduce, uh, but we would need to think more about it. Um, Just to, um, you know, to follow up, I guess that the reason why I'm asking is that if you think about, I mean, this is the dynamic model, right? So I feel like the actions that the firms are going to take are going to matter a lot on what is the belief about the duration of the shock, right? Absolutely. I think actually it might slow down further things. So uh, just uh, on my heat, on my feed, I think firms are not, you know, if firms don't realize that, or the, or if there's a probability that the shock goes away, uh, firms might actually uh, not invest enough, but it's not obvious. There's also a force that would push, there's also a probability that maybe prices go up a lot because the pandemic gets really, really bad. And then maybe you want to invest in that case. Um, so I, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there's a, uh, a sort of on the same, on the same sort of line of thought. Um, this is totally unfair because your model can't address it at all, but you get this uh, kind of timing consistency problem now, right? That says, if Absolutely. I'm going to produce, you know, if I'm going to produce ventilators, then it's really important that when the pandemic comes, I get to sell ventilators everywhere at a high price. And if the government shows up and says, no, you don't get to, we're going to buy them all from you at cost or whatever, then you have, you have this incentive to not invest mm. in ventilator capacity at all also. So there, there's kind of, there's a bunch of, I think, very interesting uh, kind of dynamic aspects to this that, um, I am required different sort of looking models, but yeah, that's definitely something kind of interesting too. Yeah, I'm sorry. We also have two, elastic. two uh, related, related questions that that you know one is one is really related to what uh, I believe uh, what Chris has has mentioned. You know, I 
I, I think the for this pandemic, in particular, the very early stage when we see the um, the kind of drop, you know, the, the shortage of the masks and all these things, I believe there's a lot of element about the supply side productivity shock rather than demand side. I know you guys have a very ambitious uh, model here already, but I but I think you know um, something could potentially help you is to look at the export of both essential and non-essential exports from say China, right? So some anecdotes here is like, you know, both, both of these actually drop dramatically out of China. And, and in fact, the non-essential drop more than the non-essential during that same period, which sort of indicating very strongly that there's a productivity shock uh, uh, going on there. You know, the later stages, I'm, I'm less sure, but I just don't know whether you guys can think so about- So you think of productivity for, for producing these goods, like- not not for for producing all goods, right? So so if you have a pandemic and if you think about lockdown, nobody's really going to work. You know, if what from what I heard is like nobody. You know, it's not like they don't have the capacity. Just nobody's going to produce the mask. You know, they're, that's they're, true. The factory didn't didn't even get started uh, all the way until like March or something. So um, so so that's also sort of related to the earlier point about you know how do we think about this E? You know whether these are happening sequentially or simultaneously seem to matter a lot. In terms so I of think in China, thank you, Daniel. Uh, I think in China, actually the response of trade flows was very, very different between essential and non-essential goods. And by essential, I mean the essential medical goods has been very different actually, uh, uh, both on the import and export side to, to the, just the non-essential goods. For the US even, um, Imports were declining, you know, massively. But uh, for all goods, except for these goods, actually, and imports of essential goods increased by you know, a massive amount. And even critical. though they're then, 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 you know, that's my point. It's like potentially that could help it to separate. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. That's that's actually something we're looking at. Even if you look at the changes in the aggregate net exports in the U.S more than 60% of this decline is coming from this very small sector, which is essential medical goods. Uh, so over the, four, you know, over the past few months, there was this one percentage point decline. Most of it is coming from this tiny sector. So yeah, um, we're- and Yeah, yeah, but, but then that's just, just a general point, just to think about whether yes. you can separate them or not. And I have a related point is also about, since you put a lot of emphasis on trade policy, I. I feel like maybe one additional thing you can look at is actually some kind of the non-tariff uh, related trade policy, you know, for instance, like the standards, right? So another important dimension is like whether, whether there's harmonization of these standards that, you know, that if, even if a location can quickly wrap up the capacity, whether these produced goods actually meet uh, the I see. standard I see. of the other country. For instance, we, we knew that you know, there's a huge lag in terms of the FDA, the FDA approving certain type Absolutely. of uh, uh, goods and you know, producing in, 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 in China, even it's available, right? So, so the, but I, I, I think there, there are certain, uh, these dimensions potentially could add some richness to your Absolutely. Your uh, actually, th that might be a way of interpreting, going back to George's question about tariff revenue. I mean, there's been a lot of, I mean, if you reduce the standards because you want to get the goods faster, that could be, you know, a reduction in trade costs that doesn't generate revenue. And similarly, the reverse, if you suddenly just block exports and you're not charging anything, you're just blocking them. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, so we haven't looked at any of that, uh, or this, yeah, of, of harmonization of goods, but yeah, that's something we should check out. Yeah, no, this is this is this is really helpful. This is this is great. So I have a question that you may know because yeah. you've been reading more papers about this kind of stuff than I have. I've read very few of them. Is there some sense in which you want to model utility as having uh, I don't know, like you want to model death somehow? Like you're basically saying this is a good that I really want but there's no kind of long run if I, even if i screw this up really bad uh you know that there's some sort of sense of recovery like uh is there a way or have other people thought about kind of different kinds of utility that sort of try to capture more the idea that this isn't just 
you know, a good that I really like, but a good that, you know, you know, hundred thousand people die. Maybe that's different yeah. than saying everybody, you know, prices go up and we all get to consume a bit less. Yes. Um, I don't know if I, I mean, I, I bet there is some, I don't know. I'm not aware of work that does that. I think here we have a representative agent. So it's like, no, if, yeah, we kill, no, then what you're if we doing, kill you the agent, then, yeah. <laughs> then we're, then we're, <laughs> So, so it's a way of, so you could imagine, I don't know if it, if it would work out, but you could imagine a model where there's heterogeneous agents, some die, some don't, and maybe aggregating up, uh, you could make it, you know, maybe there's some way of aggregating it up. We haven't done that. We, we don't know. We're not aware of that, but that's the way we're interpreting it. You know, there's some agents that maybe die and that gives you really low utility, but yeah. Yeah, but I, I bet guess the other all, issue all this recent work on epidemi epidemiological models in macro that that probably has many of these components where you have yeah. uh, more heterogeneous agents and some die, some don't, and yeah. You have one thought about an application of your framework, which is in the, if you, if you change it just a little bit, so you have a government that's aware that this event could happen, a little bit the way people are now talking about domestic subsidizing production, domestic production. It seemed like a big mechanism, and I think it's a really nice mechanism model, is in the capital stock dynamic, the country that doesn't have the comparative advantage in the potential good as an investment of the pandemic case that don't have any capital, uh, capital stock. The one kind of question is if you're thinking about a policy investment in normal times, do you want a you want a protectionist policy versus a policy that maybe subsidizes investments in the capital stock that's used in the that's a bit one of the reasons, well, one of our motivations for introducing these myopic firms in a way. It's, it introduces this wedge that firms are going to, you know, maybe there's very low probability event that you need these maps, but when you need them, you really need them. And that might introduce a motive for government. So if you did the optimal policy exercise, which is something that, yeah, that we're, we're hoping to do soon, uh, and you allow the government to introduce, well, tariff, but also subsidies, like you're saying, that that could play a role. And we actually see that even, so not, I don't know about masks, uh, I think, it, but we definitely see that for vaccines uh, currently in the US. For like the flu vaccine, the government is actually, every year it's purchasing and it's, in, it's buying a bunch of stuff, many of which it's thrown to the garbage. But it's just having it in place in case, you know, this big shock happens and we need this flu season. And, and, and so stuff like that is actually being done and has been done before. Um, so I think some of these channels may, may also be active here uh, when we do the optimal policy. Okay, so I think we'll call this the official end and turn off the recording, but everybody's welcome to stick around if they like and continue uh, to ask Fernando questions or, or make comments of, uh, of other things they're thinking about. Um, but so for everybody who's uh, about to take off, thank you as always for, uh, for coming. Next week, I'm pulling up the schedule. Uh, next week will be Adam Spencer, uh, who's going to talk about policy effects of uh, international taxation on firm dynamics and capital structures. That's uh, July 30th. And then August uh, 6th will be Ellen and Helpman, who's going to talk about when tariffs do, uh, disrupt global supply chains. Okay, so uh, I will see you guys next week.